Tonight, the growing hurricane threat, Fiona barreling towards Bermuda as a monster Category 4 storm. The island bracing for what could be a dangerous night after the storm's deadly march through the Caribbean. In Puerto Rico, homes knocked off their foundation, landslides shutting down roads. Tens of thousands of customers still without power there and in the Dominican Republic. Plus, is another major storm system following right behind. Al Roker is here tonight. Also, the new reporting on that group of migrants flown to Martha's Vineyard by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. What we're now learning about the private air charter company paid $615,000 to fly them. Did that company go out and recruit the migrants from Texas? Also, former President Trump defending the documents seized at Mar-a-Lago. Trump saying the president of the United States can declassify anything by, quote, even thinking about it. The response tonight from the court. First class attack, the American Airlines passenger caught on camera, punching a flight attendant from behind. The erratic behavior that reportedly led up to that mid-air assault. Dangerous diet, influencers and celebrities using the diabetes drug Ozempic to shed pounds. The latest weight loss craze, but is it safe? And bystander backup, how a group of good Samaritans saved a police officer during a violent traffic stop. Top story starts right now. And good evening. Tonight, we start with that trouble in the tropics. All eyes on a new storm system that could impact the U.S. and it would follow right behind Hurricane Fiona. Take a look. The new video showing the eye of Fiona, the Category 4 storm nearing Bermuda after tearing through the Caribbean. In the Dominican Republic, nearly 9,000 homes damaged or destroyed. And get this, right now, more than 700,000 people without water. In Puerto Rico, drone footage, you see it here from Ponce, shows homes knocked off their foundations, mudslides making parts of the island impossible to access, and satellite images also showing the catastrophic flooding that has washed out fields and wiped out bridges. Bermuda, now next in line, residents there boarding up homes and businesses, preparing for a potentially rough night ahead. We have teams on the ground in both Puerto Rico and Bermuda, but we want to begin tonight with Al Roker, who has the latest on this deadly storm. And now, as we look at the big board there, you see Hurricane Fiona not letting up in Bermuda right in its path. Absolutely. And we're also looking at more going on. We've got a couple of systems coming off the African coast. But right now, we'll start off with Fiona. Currently still, Category 4 storm. Currently, it's 305 miles west-southwest of Bermuda, 130-mile-per-hour winds. It's picking up its forward speed, moving northeast to 20 miles per hour. By 3 a.m. Friday, it's just to the west-northwest of Bermuda. Two to four inches of rain sees 30 to 45 feet, makes landfall in Canada, but we are looking at some surf advisories, some surf and rip currents along the eastern U.S. coast. Now, we're again watching all of this, Tom, and the next system is one we're really concerned about. Yeah, I know. A lot of people on the Gulf Coast right now concerned about what we see right there. It's called Invest 98L. Tell us more about this. All right, so we're already expecting some sort of development, 90% chance of development in the next five days, likely to become a depression in a day or two. Now, let's put the global models in into motion, and you can see anywhere from Miami to the Yucatan Peninsula, we've got the potential for development and landfall. Now, we're going to put the U.S. model and the European model. We, we've got a little, we're not really confident about this right now because we haven't seen the storm center form yet. However, look at the difference. There's landfall with the Euro in Florida on Tuesday. Next Friday is a right around landfall for the U.S. model. So, Tom, we've still got a long way to go. We've got to wait for this thing to form, and then we'll continue to track it. But again, for right now, we've got a system with a lot of potential, with a lot of damage. Yeah, and Americans all across the Gulf Coast have to be paying attention all week. All right, Al, thanks for that. We want to go now to Morgan Chesky, who's live in the crosshairs of Hurricane Fiona's outer bands in St. George's, Bermuda. He joins Top Story Live tonight. So, Morgan, I know things are just starting to pick up there. Tell me what the conditions are like right now. Yeah, Tom, we can feel this wind definitely start to pick up. The gust approaching 20 miles an hour. If Fiona stays on its current path, we could see gust upwards of 75 miles an hour sometime between midnight and 5 a.m. That is when Bermuda is expected to get the full force of Fiona. And keep in mind, this is still looking to be a glancing blow. This Category 4 hurricane could be 100 miles moving off the westward coast of Bermuda, and we could still be seeing some significant flooding in low-lying areas and some wind damage. 
stretch here. But right now, the calm before the storm definitely over. We're anticipating feeling that rain from those outer bands here any time now. Tom? You know, Morgan, even though Bermuda sits right there by itself in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, it has some of the strictest building codes of any island I've ever seen. That being said, we are talking about a Category 4 storm. So are people anxious there? Have they seen the pictures out of Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic? They absolutely have. They've been following what happened when it hit Turks and Caicos. The power outage is there for hundreds of thousands of people. I ask, actually, the Minister of National Security of Bermuda today, how concerned are you? How prepared are you? He says right now, this afternoon, they were at 95 percent. He says his biggest concern, complacency, people not taking this hurricane seriously because it is looking to make a glancing blow. But he pointed back to 2014. Tom, that was when Hurricane Faye and Gonzalo struck this island within one week's time. Nobody has forgotten that. And as for that building code, it was made even stronger following Hurricane Fabian in 2003. If a building goes up in Bermuda right now, it has to ascend 110 mile an hour winds. Fortunately, as of right now, we're not expected to see anything that strong. However, everyone knows how much a hurricane can veer in the hours ahead. Tom. Yeah, we hope those predictions are right. All right, Morgan Chesky in Bermuda. Morgan, you and your team, please stay safe tonight. We want to head now to Puerto Rico, where Hurricane Fiona's devastation in the Caribbean is coming into full focus. President Biden signing a disaster declaration as the island battles ongoing landslides and flooding. And in the hard-hit Dominican Republic, hundreds of thousands without power or water. Gabe Gutierrez is in the disaster zone again for us tonight. This was Fiona's Fury in Turks and Caicos, while Bermuda braces for a close call. In the Dominican Republic, there are still hundreds of thousands of people without water or power. Here in Puerto Rico, new landslides overnight. So we're still pretty much in this emergency response phase. Satellite images show washed out bridges in flooded fields across Puerto Rico before and after the storm. These satellite images show how much of the island is in the dark each night. This is before Fiona, and this is after. 38% of customers now have power, up from 27% yesterday. Focus. President uh, Biden has signed a major disaster declaration, and at a FEMA briefing today, he spoke with Puerto Rico's governor. And we'll do everything, everything we can to meet the urgent needs you have. With the heat index hovering around 100 degrees, this is Jose Alvarez's sweltering existence. He tells us he rode out the hurricane in remote western Puerto Rico, the river rushing under his home. Today, for the first time, local authorities brought him the bottled water he so desperately needed. Now, neighbors yell across the river to notify each other at the first glimpse of any supplies. During Hurricane Maria five years ago, this mountainside got seven inches of rain. Fiona dumped 24. We feel forgotten, this woman says. Tonight, they have at least some water here, but no power. An ongoing disaster that is all too familiar. Gabe Gutierrez joins us now from Utuado, Puerto Rico. And Gabe, we know you mentioned there in your story some of the power is coming back on, but still so many have no electricity. Do we have any idea when they'll get power fully restored? Well, Tom, it's just not clear. The governor has said that he expected it to take days, not months, like it happened following Hurricane Maria. He's hedged a bit, saying that some parts of this island, the more remote areas, will take even longer to get back. But, Tom, so many residents just are skeptical about any firm timetable. They have problems here with power, even on a good day, whether or not there's a hurricane, Tom. And, and Gabe, you've been there now a while for us. Talk to me about those high temperatures and no power. Power, which means no fans or air conditioning. I can't imagine what that's like for the elderly or, or for parents with children. It's incredibly dangerous, Tom. You know, earlier today, we were in a remote region here in Utuado on a mountainside. This community had no access to drinking water, no access to power, and it was even difficult for them to get out of their neighborhood. It was difficult to even drive up the road. Some of them didn't have access to cars, and it can be extremely dangerous to even try to go out and get gas for a portable generator. And we spoke with a 72-year-old woman that had just been brought some water bottles by local authorities that were extremely grateful. But so many residents that we've spoken to here, Tom, say they just can't understand why it seems that this government on this island can't seem to figure 
a solution out for these repeated power problems, hurricane after hurricane. Still, they're incredibly resilient and making do with what they can. Tom. Gabe Gutierrez from Puerto Rico tonight for us. Gabe, we thank you for that. We head to Washington now. Former President Trump firing back after multiple legal blows. The Justice Department regaining access to those documents seized from his Mar-a-Lago home. But the former president insisting he could declassify something just by thinking about it. NBC's Peter Alexander has more from Washington. Tonight, the latest legal setback for former President Trump. A federal appeals court ruling the Justice Department is free to resume reviewing 100 classified documents seized from Mar-a-Lago, reversing an earlier decision by a federal judge that had blocked the government from examining those materials. Mr. Trump overnight insisting he declassified the records, an argument his lawyers have not made in court. It doesn't have to be a process, as I understand it. If you're the president of the United States, you can declassify just by saying um, it's declassified, even by thinking about it. But the appeals court brushed off that argument as a red herring, saying the documents are still government property, whether or not they were declassified. Then there's the new $250 million civil lawsuit against Mr. Trump, as well as Ivanka, Don Jr., and Eric Trump, brought by New York's Attorney General Letitia James. Mr. Trump slamming the suit by James, a Democrat, as a politically motivated witch hunt. She campaigned on it four years ago. It was a vicious campaign, and she just talked about Trump, and we're going to indict him, we're going to get him. James is accusing Mr. Trump of inflating his assets to get more favorable loans and better tax rates. The pattern of fraud and deception that was used by Mr. Trump and the Trump Organization for their own financial benefit is astounding. One example she cites, Mr. Trump's 212-acre estate outside Manhattan bought for $7.5 million that was later valued at nearly $300 million on what James says were false claims that it had been zoned for mansions. But Mr. Trump argues the banks were responsible for their own valuations. These are banks that have the best law firms in the world, the biggest and best and most powerful. They do their own work. They don't rely on us. All right, Peter joins us tonight from Washington. And Peter, I want to go back to the president's comments over how to declassify documents. They've been getting so many headlines. Do we know if there's any legal precedent for what the president stated in that interview? Or did the president further explain his comments that a president can declassify just by thinking about it, to use his words? Yeah, he basically was saying that you can declassify by thought alone. Obviously, Tom, it doesn't work that way. The experts agree, and it just doesn't make sense here. The president didn't go beyond that, but that was the comment he made. We're already hearing some pushback from some Republicans, among them John Thune, one of the Republican leaders, saying that there is a process for declassifying information. And as Thune describes it, that should be adhered to and follow, Tom. And Peter, sticking in Washington, I want to move to the January 6th committee. I know you have some new reporting. The committee set to interview a highly anticipated witness. Yeah, that's right. We're learning Ginny Thomas, the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. She's also a conservative activist. She's agreed to be interviewed by the January 6th committee in the coming weeks. The committee wants to ask about her communications with a Trump lawyer who was pushing a plan to overturn the 2020 elections results. The committee, by the way, is going to hold its next hearing next Wednesday. Tom. All right, Peter Alexander for us tonight. Peter, we thank you for that. Next tonight, to a major update on a story we've been covering closely, we have new reporting that the air charter company that assisted Governor Ron DeSantis in flying dozens of migrants to Martha's Vineyard has close political ties to the Republican Party. Vertol Systems Company has contributed thousands of dollars to GOP super PACs and was once legally represented by close political allies of the governor. To date, the company has received nearly $1.6 million in payments having to do with DeSantis's migrant moving program. I want to bring in NBC News senior national political reporter Mark Caputo, who broke this story for us. So, Mark, tell us what dots you connected when it comes to the air charter company that did this and Governor Ron DeSantis. From what I understood in my reporting is this company, Vertol Systems, which few people have really heard about, had given a, num a bunch of money to a number of candidates, including the former Secretary of Education in Florida, Richard Corcoran, who's a DeSantis ally. But when he was running for governor in 2017, he, was, he re received $15,000 from this group. So I called up people affiliated with the fundraiser and found out that the money had been given at a fundraiser hosted by Matt Gates, the congressman from the panhandle, who's a close ally of Governor DeSantis. And from there, 
I realized in checking the records that Matt Gates and Ron DeSantis's current public safety czar in charge of immigration, a man named Larry Keefe, were law partners together, and both Gates and Larry Keefe represented Vertol Systems, this very company that now got this contract to move these migrants, which the governor's office won't comment on, it won't tell us the scope of work, they won't give us the contract despite Florida's sunshine laws. So I just put the dots together and reported what we know, and that's about it. Mark, you know, I want to show some of our viewers right now, some of your reporting that's on NBCNews.com right now. I want to show a portion of, of, of the report. You write, in Vertol's only known case of relocating migrants, the company received an initial $615,000 last week and recruited almost 50 destitute asylum-seeking Venezuelan migrants in San Antonio, Texas, gave them food and at least one night's hotel stay, and then flew them to Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, as part of DeSantis' effort to highlight the toll of illegal immigration. Now, Mark, here's the part I'm confused about. What is a transportation company doing looking for and recruiting undocumented immigrants? That, that sounds like much more than getting people from point A to point B. That's a good question. Boy, I wish the governor's office would answer that, but I, I'm sorry to be sarcastic about this. But what is Vertol Systems doing moving migrants? It's making money hand over fist. I mean, we're talking about $1.6 million, and the last trip to Delaware got scrapped at the last minute, and that was $950,000. We'd love to know what happened in that case as well. Lots of questions, lots of unanswered questions. There's also lots of lawsuits that are starting to crop up. Lawyers for the migrants who were sent to Martha's Vineyard have sued, saying their clients were misled and they were victims of fraud. The Florida Senate Democrats are suing as well, or planning to sue, because under the state budget authorizing this, quote, unauthorized alien removal program, it says that the migrants in question need to be removed, quote, from this state. This state is Florida. But for some reason, they went to San Antonio to get the migrants. And by the way, they were asylum-seeking Venezuelans. And it turns out the Republicans who crafted the program said in the legislature, in public, during committee, and theoretically under oath, that Venezuelan asylum seekers, when asked this very question, are not unauthorized aliens. So you have an unauthorized alien removal program from Florida, which removed authorized aliens from Texas. Finally, and someone I, made $1.6 million off yeah. of this. Finally, Mark, you know, I, I guess the last question is, what does Vert, Vertol, the, the company in Florida, have to say? I know you try to get some answers. Oh, they say nothing. I called and they hung up. We left some other messages earlier in the week, but met with no call back. At least in this case, I had the courtesy of someone hanging up. All right. Mark Caputo with some new reporting uh, on a very big story we've been covering. Mark, we appreciate it. Next tonight to a wild moment caught on camera in the skies over California. A passenger punching a flight attendant in the back of the head. It was all captured on camera after he was asked to leave first class and return to his seat. The confrontation coming amid a difficult new year for flight crews with violent interactions at an all-time high. NBC's Maya Eaglin has that video and this story. Tonight, this disturbing attack. Oh An American Airlines flight attendant brutally punched in the back of the head by a passenger. What are you doing? All of it captured by a fellow flyer. The cabin left stunned. Kevin Hoover says he had a front row seat to the man's erratic behavior on the flight from Cabo San Lucas, Mexico to Los Angeles. According to the criminal complaint, the passenger had moved into first class, his temper apparently flaring after he was asked to move back to his assigned seat. A gentleman came up and sat in the empty seat across the aisle from me and started mumbling. The flight crew, with the help of Hoover, able to calm down the suspect until the plane landed. Flight attendant grabbed some restraints, and her and I went back there, and I just told him, I said, we're going to put these on you. And he just put his hands up and let us do it. The passenger taken off the flight by police in Los Angeles and detained by the FBI, and now charged with interfering with the flight crew, a federal offense. American Airlines banning that passenger from all future flights, writing in a statement, Acts of violence against our team members are not tolerated, adding, our thoughts are with our injured flight attendant. The punch, part of a troubling rise in mid-air confrontations. Oh. 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 
The FAA dealing with more than 1,900 unruly passengers this year alone. That's an average of seven per day. They launched 680 investigations. Those numbers down from the peak in 2021 when bad behavior spiked during COVID mask mandates, but still four times higher than pre-pandemic levels. It's devastating watching something like that, knowing exactly what that crew is going through, that they can't just pull off to the side and get help. My heart broke for them, but it also broke for the flight attendants all over the country who are watching that video today and still going to work. Where, where does that emotion come from you? This is really hard because this is not the job that we signed up for, the job that we know. Maya Eaglin joins us now in studio. So we just heard there from that flight attendant, and it, it sounded like she was getting emotional. Absolutely. You know, she said it's really overwhelming to have to go to work, to have her friends, people she know go to work, and have to be fearful of their safety. They're already taking self-defense classes, but they're asking for more. They're asking for legislative accountability and legislative changes so this doesn't happen again. Yeah, yeah more definitely has to be done. And I'm curious, do they have any advice for passengers if you're on the plane and you see one of these violent incidents break out? What should you do? The biggest thing is to listen to directions given to you from flight attendants and only intervening if you're asked to or if someone's immediate safety is at risk. Aside from that, just being nice, respectful and attentive can really go a long way. All right, Maya Eaglin for us. Maya, we appreciate it. We turn out at the end of an international manhunt, a man known as Fat Leonard escaping house arrest in San Diego as he awaited sentencing for the Navy's largest bribery case. But after weeks on the run, he was captured in South America. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock has those details. Tonight, a former military contractor known as Fat Leonard on the run for weeks after ripping off his GPS ankle bracelet was recaptured in Venezuela, authorities say. Leonard Glenn Francis pleaded guilty in 2015 to a sprawling bribery and corruption scandal involving senior naval officers. The largest in naval history, and he was set to be sentenced today, but he slipped away from his Tony San Diego home weeks ago. The Navy is embarrassed in the extreme. Uh, but so is the U.S. Marshal Service with somebody cutting off an ankle bracelet and disappearing. Uh, that was an incredibly well-planned, organized uh, escape. After an alert was activated indicating Leonard's bracelet had been tampered with on September 4th, San Diego police went to his home. Turn it off the door, but you're not getting a response. Subject isn't responding to messages or calls. But all they found, they said, was the bracelet, no Leonard. The U.S. government posting a $40,000 reward for information leading to his arrest. Neighbors told U.S. Marshals that several U-Haul trucks had been in and out of the house all week. There were people that were moving things in and out, but they were just shadows. I just, I saw them from my peripheral vision. The director of Interpol Venezuela says Francis got to the country from Mexico with a stopover in Cuba. He was apprehended by Venezuelan authorities at the Simon Bolivar International Airport while trying to eventually get to Russia, according to a Marshall spokesperson. Francis was on house arrest due to health issues, including a bout with kidney cancer. He was arrested in 2013 and pleaded guilty to offering $500,000 in bribes of luxury travel, prostitutes, and free hotel rooms to Navy officers. A court then finding he overcharged the Navy to the tune of roughly $35 million for servicing vessels and lured ships to his port in Indonesia, all of it in exchange for classified information, now faces 25 years in prison. Pat Leonard uh, knew where the ships were going, and he was capable, possibly, of providing that information to other parties, or someone he contracted, subcontracted to, might have done that. This historic public corruption scandal lasted more than a decade and involved dozens of U.S. Navy officers. You're talking about commanders and admirals. How serious is that? It's brutally painful. All right, Sam Brock joins us now from Miami. Sam, do we have any sense of when Fat Leonard will be prosecuted in the U.S.? So we are relying right now, Tom, on the Venezuelan authorities and the director of Interpol in Venezuela says that they've initiated at this point the proceedings for extraditing Fat Leonard. The problem is, who knows what that timeline looks like? Is it going to be days? Is it going to be weeks? And also, will it happen at all? Because the United States, Tom, of course, doesn't recognize the government of Nicolas Maduro. Venezuela is one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world right now. There is no U.S. embassy in Venezuela. It is very rare that law enforcement officials from the United States and Venezuela are even cooperating on any sort of law enforcement issue. So is this even going to come to fruition? And you got to ask, what sort of chip is Venezuela looking to use this for? Do they want sanctions relief to have someone else freed from the United States? It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. So, Sam, you know, he, he's called Fat Leonard. He, he obviously lost a lot of weight. 
but he was being watched and then he, he cuts off his electric monitoring device. How easy is that to do? You would think it would be very difficult to get a GPS monitor bracelet off. However, I spoke with a law enforcement official who used to work for the FBI. He said it's actually not that hard. It appears that he cut it off using some heavy scissors in his house. The reason many people who have these bracelets on don't do it is because they know they're going right back to jail. And in fact, there was an alert that was issued as soon as the monitor was dislodged. However, by the time authorities got there, he was already gone. There was no disincentive in this case for Fat Leonard not to take it off because he was planning on leading an international excursion. Of course, authorities looking for him for weeks. And now maybe he's regretting that. All right, Sam Brock for us from Miami. Sam, we appreciate it. Still ahead tonight, the pandemic fraud. How a federal watchdog says fraudsters stole, get this, $50 billion in unemployment benefits as COVID ravaged this country. Plus, the officer attacked during a traffic stop. You see it right here. How a group of other drivers stepped in to help him. And the latest weight loss craze, have you heard about it? Influencers and celebra celebrities using the diabetes drug Ozempic to diet. But could it cause more harm to the body? That's next. You may recognize that commercial. It's for Ozempic, a medication used to treat type 2 diabetes. However, it's now gaining popularity as an off-label weight loss drug being used by those on social media and even in Hollywood. But it's leading to a shortage of the drug for the people that actually depend on it. NBC's Hallie Jackson has this story. Taking my first dose of Azempic. In three weeks, I went down a full dress size. TikTok is all over it. The girls that get it, get it. Four weeks in and down 12 pounds. And so are some celebrities. It's being used... I think widely, not only in Hollywood, but across the general population. It's brand name, Ozempic, a drug you inject that's meant to regulate insulin and treat type 2 diabetes. It does improve insulin secretion, so it certainly, uh, in that way, is a treatment for type 2 diabetes. But now, some people are using it to lose weight. The adults lost on average up to 12 pounds. Oh, up to 12 pounds. It delays um, what we call gastric emptying. That's how fast uh, food leaves your stomach, so you feel full longer. Um, and it also controls how full we feel generally, and so people eat less. Well, doctors say it may work. Taking Ozempic for weight loss is technically off off label. That means a doctor has prescribed it for an issue it's not approved to treat, and that's allowed. But this kind of thing can have consequences in the market. Like now, there's an Ozempic shortage. But it's part of a larger problem that we have in the United States. We have more than 200 active drug shortages right now. Michael Gagno is a senior director at a pharmaceutical industry trade group. He says shortages like this one have been an issue for decades. This has been a chronic problem in the United States. It's gone on for about 20 years, and we've really not done a lot to mitigate the, the uh, issue. In a statement to NBC News, the FDA says it's working closely with the manufacturers of semaglutide injection, the generic name for Ozempic, to help address the shortage of these products and confirms healthcare professionals can choose to prescribe drugs off label when medically appropriate. The company that makes Ozempic says they do not promote, suggest, or encourage off label use of their medicines and are committed to fully complying with all applicable U.S. laws. And they say in terms of supply, the combo of incredible demand plus global supply constraints means some disruption in getting Ozempic to patients. I'm taking my second Ozempic injection. People with diabetes are incredibly frustrated that Ozempic is being touted as a weight loss drug because while it has such great benefits for people, it's really disheartening that people with diabetes who need this medication for blood sugar management can't necessarily get access to it. All right, that was Hallie Jackson reporting for Top Story tonight. This thing is really taking off on social media. So for more on this weight loss fad and the effects it could possibly have on the body, I want to bring in NBC Health and Medical Unit fellow, Dr. Akshay Sayal. Doctor, thanks so much for joining Top Story and welcome to the broadcast. I think it's the first time we've had you on. So my first question is simple. Is this safe for people who might want to lose weight? So, Tom, to be clear, this is an FDA-approved medication. Now, there's, there's a catch here. It's FDA-approved for those who have diabetes, and at higher doses, it's actually called Wigovi, which is a little bit confusing, but that's FDA-approved for people who are obese looking to lose weight. Now, if you're not in one of those two categories, you know, you're really kind of flying blind here. You're in a gray zone. We don't have the kind of rigorous data we need um, to say this is truly a safe and effective thing to lose weight. But, but doctors are prescribing it. So, so I have to ask you, I mean, if you're somebody who's looking 
to lose a few LBs, maybe it's 20 pounds, maybe it's 30 pounds, is it safe? So, it, you know, if you're not in one of those two categories, you're being prescribed it off-label. And, you know, off-label medications are prescribed. You know, my roommate in med school, he had what we call performance anxiety disorder. And he was prescribed a heart medication off-label. So anytime he would go up and give a speech, he would take that medication. And so off-label is not without precedent. Um, but if you are going to take something off-label, you really need to make sure you are seeing a doctor regularly and you don't just lose the follow-up. If you are taking this medication off-label, does insurance cover it? How much are we talking? Because I've, I've heard it's very expensive. So if it's off-label, usually insurance will not cover it. And it's about 1000 to $1,200 a month, which is like... 1000 a month to it, take this? It's like buying a new iPhone every month, right? Okay. It's, it's expensive. And then... I guess I have to ask you, I mean, is there a, an ethics question here? If, if people with diabetes can't get this drug, then why are doctors prescribing it? And I'd also say, I put it on the patients or the people losing weight, why are people taking it if, if people who truly need this to live can't find it? You know, there's, there's probably a lot of reasons for that. And I think one of the things to point out is I don't know if people really realize how dangerous it is for diabetics to miss their medications. You know, we see this all the time in the hospital. People come in with their blood sugars too high. They get serious infections. You know, they may be in the ICU. So it's, it's really important for people to be aware. You are, you know, if the drug is in a shortage, there are some people with diabetes who may only be on this medication. And it's important to take it. Um, and it's, it's something you definitely need to be aware of for doctors, too. Does it work for people who want to lose weight? Yeah, so short answer, yes, it does. For patients who are diabetic and for patients who are obese, you can expect about, you know, up to a 15% change in body weight. So if you're 200 pounds, for example, that's a 30-pound weight loss in about a year's time frame. I mean, we basically think it works by telling your brain that you're full. So you basically eat less. Finally, just real quick, then, is it a money play for these doctors? If insurance doesn't take it and they're writing the scripts, are they making money on the back end? Uh, yeah, usually, usually not. You know, if we prescribe things off-label, that's, that's handled entirely by the pharmacy and by the patient. Okay. Doctor, great having you on Top Story. I know I asked you a lot of tough questions, but I appreciate your candidness. Thanks so much. All right, when we come back, another recall for Tesla. This one's huge. The window issue now impacting more than one million vehicles. What drivers need to know next. All right, we're back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the alarming new report on pandemic-related fraud. This one's going to get you really upset. A federal watchdog found an estimated nearly $50 billion was stolen from the nation's unemployment insurance program. The Labor Department's Inspector General says applicants received aid using dead people's Social Security numbers and the names of people serving federal prison terms. A group of Good Samaritans caught on camera helping an officer after she was attacked during a traffic stop in Ohio. The officer's dash cam shows the driver who was pulled over for speeding get out of the car. After a verbal argument, you can see that driver punches the officer in the face. Other drivers witnessing the attack, racing to her aid, they managed to pull the man to the ground and hold him there until backup arrived. That officer is okay. New York City setting up new ways to house an influx of migrants from the southern border. Mayor Eric Adams announcing tent-like structures that his administration is calling emergency relief centers. He says the migrants will only be housed there for their first few days in the city and will be offered food, medical care, and other services. Migrant advocate groups have already raised legal concerns about these shelters. And a consumer alert tonight, Tesla is recalling more than one million vehicles. The car company says an issue with the automatic windows can force them to close on drivers. The recall covers several models, but the company says the problem can be fixed with a software update. There is more information on our website, NBCNews.com. Okay, we want to turn now to the latest on the water crisis in Mississippi. Residents filing a class action lawsuit claiming the water in Jackson caused various health problems, but the mayor says he drinks it and he showed us. Sinclair Esamwa has the details. Cassandra Welchin is a lifelong Jackson, Mississippi resident. I wouldn't drink the water because, you know, we don't trust it. Welchin, a social worker and mom of three, says she's worried for her kids' health. What impact do you feel this water crisis is having on your kids specifically? With Zaya, who has a disability, right, it has been very difficult for her to comprehend in some ways don't drink the water, don't use the water. And she began to have, you know, upset stomach. And she's not alone in her concern. A group of Jackson residents filing a class action lawsuit alleging the water crisis caused various health problems like malnutrition and lead poisoning. The lawsuit against the city of Jackson, two private engineering companies, and Mississippi officials, including Jackson's mayor, Chokwe Lumumba. 
What's your response to the hundreds of Jackson families who say their water is not safe or has faced lead contamination? The issues of, of uh, insecurity in the water, the challenges with that water has been well documented. We have warned them uh, when those circumstances exist. Now, with respect to the lawsuit itself, uh, I won't litigate that. Do you drink it? I drink it every day. I drink it every day. However, uh, that doesn't mean that I don't understand that I don't understand the insecurity of our residents when they're being told to boil their water each and every day. Lamumba says the city's ongoing water challenges are partially due to a lack of investment in Jackson. Without significant capital improvements, uh, it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when these challenges will arise again. This, as Governor Reeves on Friday, sparked controversy over these remarks. As always, a great day to not be in Jackson. The mayor adding that state leadership must invest more resources into the predominantly black city of Jackson to benefit residents like Welchin. This just did not start um, this year. Um, it's been going on for a very long time. All right, Sinclair Essamwell joins Top Story tonight from Jackson, Mississippi. Sinclair, I want to go back to that moment we just saw in your story. Talk to me about the moment the mayor drank the tap water. Yeah, Tom, so a lot of us were holding our breath to see if he actually would. I asked some residents about it, and they said, I don't know that the mayor actually drinks the water. He did, as you saw in that piece. But he also acknowledged that he knows many Jacksonians are hesitant to do so, the reason being because of the repeated water crises the city has faced. And when I asked him, do you think this is the last boil water advisory, Tom, he said no. He expects it to come back. And I think that overall reflects the sentiment that's really prevalent here in Jackson. Tom? Is the mayor concerned? Because he's also being named in that lawsuit, some residents really want him to pay as well. Yeah, Tom, so I asked him directly about that. His direct words were that I believe that the city's firm is handling the case, and that's sort of the extent that he spoke to that. But it really is a reflection of how frustrated residents are right now. Cassandra, that mother you heard from, even said that when her children forget not to drink the water, they get diarrhea, they get upset stomachs, and her bathroom was littered with water bottles from what the family does every single day. So people like her and the many individuals in that lawsuit are now demanding change from officials. Time will tell if it comes. Tom. All right, Sinclair SMO with a lot of good new reporting on that crisis there in Jackson. Now to Top Stories Global Watch, and we begin with the migrant tragedy off the coast of northern Syria. Officials say a boat packed with up to 150 people capsized on the way from Syria to Lebanon. More than 30 people killed, at least 14 were rescued from the water, and crews are now searching for survivors. Mexico hit with its second deadly earthquake just this week. The 6.8 magnitude quake rocking the western state of Michoacan. Several homes destroyed and at least two people dead. It comes just three days after a magnitude 7.6 earthquake hit the same region. And heavy rains triggering flash floods in Spain. Take a look at this. New video shows roads completely submerged, about 25 miles outside of Madrid. Cars left trapped in the floodwaters. Homes also damaged. The severe rain coming after this summer's historic heat wave across Spain and other parts of Europe. Okay, now to the Americas, and tonight we take you to the Texas border and the SOS coming from local officials. Resources are running out as a large number of migrants make their way to El Paso. NBC's Julia Ainsley is there. We're in El Paso, where tonight city officials say their resources are being pushed to the brink by a record number of migrants, averaging over 1,500 illegal border crossings a day in this area. Migrants sleeping on the streets. Now, the city's Democratic mayor taking a page from some Republican governors, sending more than 3,400 migrants on daily buses to cities like New York and Chicago. We had a huge increase. When you have a huge increase, then you need to continue to adapt. Though the unlike the Republican barrier. governors, he's giving cities notice. Are you getting enough support from the Biden administration? I've been over to Washington, and I've been able to talk to them. And, you no, know, the biggest thing we need is decompression. But Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas taking aim at the governor's who are transporting migrants without any notice. When a governor acts unilaterally and refuses to coordinate with other government officials, that is when um, problems arise. And that is when we deplore political stuntsmanship, when we're dealing with the lives of vulnerable individuals. While Republicans blame President Biden's policies, a top administration border official is blaming Congress. Congress really needs to take 
action. But I think uh, people across the country should know that it's not chaos here. Bobby Garcia is a pastor at a local church in El Paso. He and other church leaders have been offering a helping hand the last few days, but admits they need more help. It's like a glass of water. When it's at capacity, then what happens? It starts spilling out. You know what? And you don't. You know the water's going to make a mess. Is it time for other cities to share part of that burden? Uh, it, it's been time, man. But with border patrol and local shelters over capacity, immigration officials here have released nearly 1,300 migrants onto the street in the past two weeks. We witnessed roughly 100 being dropped off by the city at a nearby hotel. We met Jenny, who told us she has no money, nothing to eat, and nothing to wear besides the clothes on her back. She is one of so many Venezuelans without family or sponsors to take them in. And we came across these migrants with Border Patrol just after crossing from Mexico. Who's from Venezuela? Venezuela. Tonight, many residents telling us the border crisis has become too much to handle. How do you feel about your mayor sending them on buses to those cities? I'm, well, kind of sad because I don't know what else he can do in Mexico because he can only handle, handle so much. Tom, as you heard, a lot of residents and community leaders here in El Paso have compassion for these migrants, but they're worried that their city's resources are being stretched. In fact, a lot of them support their mayor here who's sending these migrants to other cities. And unlike Republican governors who are trying to make a political point, he says he's doing this for humanitarian reasons, simply getting these migrants, many of them Venezuelans without a place to stay, to another destination where they could have a hope for a better future. Julia Ainsley from El Paso tonight for us. Julia, we thank you. Coming up, the Hall of Famer and the welfare scandal. The major update on Brett Favre and that case down in Mississippi. The key government player who just pleaded guilty. What it could mean for Favre going forward. All right, we're back now with the ongoing investigation into the Mississippi welfare spending scandal. You may remember we first brought you the story last week. Part of the case involves former NFL quarterback Brett Favre, and now a key figure is pleading guilty to federal fraud charges. John Davis directed the state's welfare agency while it misspent tens of millions of dollars intended to help poor families, instead using the funds for projects including a new volleyball facility Favre had requested. For more on the latest legal development and what it could mean for the Hall of Famer, I want to bring in justice and intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian. Ken, you've led the reporting for NBC News on this story. So Davis has agreed to plead guilty to conspiracy to commit fraud and theft charges. That together carries a maximum of 15 years in prison. Favre has yet to be charged for his alleged involvement in the scandal, which included securing more than $5 million for a new volleyball facility that benefited his daughter. What does Davis's plea mean really for Favre and the possibility of him facing charges? This is a big deal, Tom, because John Davis was the director of the welfare agency, and he has not only pleaded guilty, he has agreed to cooperate. And his sentence is going to be contingent on the cooperation that he provides to the FBI and federal authorities. And he was in a lot of meetings with Brett Favre and, of course, his boss, the former Republican governor of Mississippi, Phil Bryant, about these efforts to get Favre this money. And Favre didn't just get the $5 million for the volleyball facility for the university where his daughter was playing volleyball. He also got around $3 million for a drug company in which he was a major investor called Prevacus that was touting a treatment for concussions, which was not approved by the FDA. So Favre is a major player in this scandal. It's not clear what John Davis has to offer about Brett Favre, who has consistently said he didn't know this was welfare money. He didn't know it was coming from the state welfare agency, Tom, but Favre is saying he did nothing wrong. We'll just have to see where this leads. Yeah, Brett Favre has denied wrongdoing through his lawyer, saying, as you mentioned, he did not know the state grants came from federal welfare funds, but he's been interviewed by the FBI, right, Ken? So if a federal agency has gone this far to interview him and, and this key player has just pleaded guilty, do we have any idea where Brett Favre is right now with this investigation and how authorities view him? This is a fast-moving investigation. We, right now, we have no indication that, that Favre is a target. The FBI did interview him a while ago, we learned. Uh, but at the same time, we just saw text, text messages that show that Favre was deeply involved in pressuring the governor and trying to get this money, and that he knew it came from the state welfare agency. So it's reasonable to assume that the FBI uh, is going to want to talk to him about that, uh, and uh, particularly when they hear what John Davis has to say about, about those meetings. There's 
no doubt that Brett Favre is a key figure in this whole affair. Uh, whether he has criminal culpability is an open question. Obviously, he insists he does not. So you have Davis, who pleaded guilty. He directed that welfare agency. You have Brett Favre here, who we know the FBI spoke to. But then you also have the governor at the time, Phil Bryant. Do we have any idea about his involvement, and could he possibly be the next domino to fall? Look, so Bryant has obviously denied wrongdoing, but a lot of legal analysts are looking at today's developments and saying this plea deal for the welfare director is yep. bad news for the former governor. Because when federal investigators flip a witness, the idea usually is they want to get, they're looking to, uh, for information about the next person higher on the food chain. Well, the only person higher than John Davis, the director of the Mississippi Welfare Agency, is former governor Phil Bryant. And there are text messages that show that Bryant was heavily involved in trying to channel this welfare money. Now, he insists he didn't know it came from the Federal Welfare Fund, but he knew it came from the Department of Human Services, which is the anti-poverty agency in Mississippi. So a lot of questions remaining about Phil Bryant's role in all of this uh, and, and what John Davis, the welfare director who pleaded guilty today, has to say about it. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, Ken, I know you and your team will stay on top of all of it. And coming up on Top Story, a father's desperate search for a life-saving surgery for his daughter, the emotional cross-country trip to save her life. Finally tonight, crossing the country for a cure, a father from New York flying coast to coast to help his daughter get a life-saving surgery. That father now sharing his story and thanking the doctor who told him to take a chance. In late 2020, the Grajales family from New York faced a startling diagnosis. Their daughter, Haley, had an AVM, a tangle of blood vessels in her brain, and one had burst, requiring emergency surgery. So she was at risk the whole entire time after that procedure was done to have another rupture. With the risk of another rupture high, Dad Andres did his own research to find a specialist neurosurgeon. He found one. The problem? The doctor was thousands of miles away in the Bay Area. They wanted to get their child cured as soon as possible. That neurosurgeon, Dr. Adib Abla at UCSF Health. We got on a Zoom call with him. And right away, he gave us the confidence to say, you know, what are you waiting for? I'm here. Come. So without a surgery scheduled, without knowing if insurance would even pay, Haley's family flew from New York to San Francisco to see Dr. Abla. You ready for this? You ready? That cross-country trip paying off. The surgery Good. was a success. And now more than a year later, Haley and her dad flying across the country again. Remember when we first came? Participating in the Aneurysm and AVM Foundation Walk. The view looks so pretty. Yeah. Sharing their story. It was very scary when, when it ruptured. And reuniting with a doctor who told them to take a chance and help save Haley's life. It's crazy. I don't even know how to put it in words, but um, I'm grateful for him. It is a great amount of satisfaction to know that um, we do have the capabilities and the personnel and the expertise here to tackle cases that aren't being tackled elsewhere. And we want to thank our NBC station in the Bay Area for their help on that story. We also want to thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.